All right, we're going to start with our questions now, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve Rui. Um, I wanted to ask uh, both Steve, Bruce, and Dean about the um, ability to queue up multiple selected uh, portions on the various services like managed copy, um, ultraviolet. I know that the uh, educators are talking about we need to queue up multiple um, selections, multiple scenes. Can you do that through that? And will you be able to do that through the various um, access services? Meaning, can you queue up more than one? If I wanted to show minute two and minute 15 and minute 30, would that be possible? Well, you could certainly queue up uh, multiple titles uh, on Flickster. I understand that. Okay, you're talking about multiple points within yes uh, within the same title. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure on, on, on a service like on the ultraviolet service. Um, you know, digital copy, as you know, is different from managed copy. Sure. And it's here now and it's going to be more, more and more prevalent and, and it certainly would be possible for you to have a digital copy. You may well have a digital copy on the laptop and a digital copy that's accessible through uh, a service like this. And that would be one way. I, I just don't know, frankly, but I will try and find that out for both Metropilot and for uh, digital copy. Yeah, managed copy. Um, when it comes, you could devise a program, I think, that would work um, for queuing that up, uh, but it's not, it's not here yet. Um, and we're not I, I just want to be sure I, I understand the question when I go back to, to, check, to look into this. This would be for queuing up multiple clips from a single title. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. okay. And um, Mr. Fraterni, um you mentioned ability to manipulate um, as a necessary for teaching. Would, does, how does the ability to, manip to manipulate video depend on quality? Like, why is the ability to teach how to manipulate it depend on the quality? Is it putting pieces together? Does it matter, how does that uh, matter how hard quality the pieces are? Yeah, no, so I think this is, so I think this is a yeah, really important. Um, uh, so one of the major ways that, that video is used in classrooms now is by students who then will edit clips together, uh, add voiceover commentary sometimes, um, and when they look at the images, they're studying them not the way we are here. This is a very artificial context. Uh, they're actually analyzing them often very closely, comparing images side by side. Um, and, uh, and so if you're going to talk about an image, um, like the students, the high school students talking about <coughs> Citizen Kane, um, they, they realized that they, they, were, they couldn't focus on the image when it was distorted, but also they couldn't look at the details and copy up the details. They were forced to talk about it at a certain level that was only that was available to them. So the visual details weren't always available. The audio, the audio uh, details weren't always available to them. Um, so one example of a, a assignment I've seen many times is students uh, doing a voiceover over a series of clips um, in a sociology class that we talked about where students look at uh, commodities and the way the commodities um, circulate globally, um, but also the way the commodities are presented in, in popular media. Um, and there they're talking about diamonds, and we, we put blood diamond to diamond commercials. Um, and they're looking, they want to look at the way that blood diamonds are, are shown in the movie blood diamonds. Right? And, um, and so they're really looking at the, the quality of the image and, um, and, and you know, the presentation of the image. So in that case, the analysis of the close to the careful details um, is really important. The analysis, you just mentioned a couple of yeah. things that I'm familiar with, diamond commercials, blood okay. diamonds. How's the quality of that, of those clips relevant? And I get that quality is relevant, but again, how is the difference, what's the added difference between, say, something like screen capture or smartphone capture? As a larger theme, how's the, how's the granular quality matter difference? How that um, okay, let's go back to this the, uh, Citizen Kane example that right. we've seen a few times today. Um, so this was this one scene, a uh, very famous scene, in which um, there's a lot of depth of field. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things the movie's famous for. The image of uh, Kane is in the background in the distance. Uh, it's very bright. The image of his mother in the foreground is very dark. Um, in the Blu-ray version we saw, um, you actually get a sense of distance that you don't get in the same way with the DVD. Uh, there are a few things that contribute to that. The big one is the, the, the deeper blacks you see in Blu-ray. It actually changes the distance. And so that would be useful if you're studying the cinematography, right, how one's sort of made in cinematography in that. Um, but also, if you were studying, um, studying it from a sociological perspective, like the American Studies professors I mentioned, 
and they're talking about the, the way in which what's going on in the background comments on what's going on in the foreground. In the Blu-ray in the Blu-ray disc, there actually was a real background and a real foreground. In the DVD image, which is a lot, um, it's a lot, uh, you don't see the same deep blacks, you don't see the same definition, all of a sudden you don't have the same board and foreground and background. And I'm trying to get a sense of many examples of this, and we're coming, we keep coming back to one, it seems, and I mean, I understand this is a significant film, but I was asking about some of these other examples that you mentioned, the diamond example. How is, specifically, what's, how's the difference in quality matter for that example? So, um, we, uh, so in that example, um, so you, know, you would talk about the, the, if you're looking at a diamond, um, a diamond commercial, um, there, there are a few ways that it, could, um, that, it could, that it could matter. So one is this effective response. When you look at a diamond and you look at audiences watching a diamond commercial, if the diamond is very clear and crisp and sparkly, it might respond in one way. If the diamond is kind of muddy and blurred, they're not going to, it's not going to sparkle in the same way the original diamond would. But, um, but also, um, you know, they might be looking at it um, more aesthetically and thinking about um, you know, the way the diamond is positioned. Is the diamond on the finger? Or do we, um, you know, can, we get, can we define the, the diamond clearly from the finger? Um, uh, I didn't, I don't know. Do you have any reaction to the notion that um, some students couldn't imagine anything better than DVD? So actually, the more I think about it, the more I realize this is more of kind of cost of living raise rather than a dramatic expansion of the existing exemption. Um, Three years later, the same images we looked at in this room just don't look, don't look as good. I find that Avatar image shocking, the, the difference between the DVD and the Blu-ray. Um, Blu uh, Avatar is a film that was sent out in over 100 different versions to different movie theaters, so that it looked just right in all, every different screening context. There were many, many different versions released on Blu-ray, on, um, on DVD, and other formats, so they looked perfect in those formats. In fact, the Blu-ray of Avatar didn't have any DVD extras because they wanted to use every single possible uh, bit of space on the disc to improve the quality of the film. Um, that's the way it's meant to be shown, it's the way it's meant to be studied. Stand up for a second. Um, just on the, on the point that you had raised about the, the difference between the, the Blu-ray and the DVD and Citizen Kane and the depth of field, I was able to see a little more in terms of the depth of field, but I also saw you mentioned the the blacker blacks, which tended, at least in my viewing of that, to distort some parts that actually the DVD was clearer when it came to those dark areas and the Blu-ray distorted it. So don't we get into a situation where there are a lot of different variables at stake? And can you comment on that? Yeah, so I think that's exactly right. Um, and uh, the question is which one is distorted, um, right? They, they look different. But they were both distorted for certain exactly. purposes. Exactly, they're both right? distorted for, for certain purposes. Um, and in lots of different classrooms, um, people study media for different, lots of different kinds of reasons. And I actually think all those types of media should be available. So it's very possible for media studies classroom that show a DVD and a Blu-ray to talk about the different qualities of the different images. In which case, you want them both available. It might be possible in the same sociology class, which is looking at the circulation of, of uh, I know I should come back to the example, the circulation of diamonds, right? Um, and to show that when, you, when you're looking at this, this uh, image in, the, in a third world country, which has you know, dial-up internet, uh, and you're watching it on YouTube, it's going to look very different than the same image which is shown on a high definition TV in the US. And what about Jonathan's point that uh, the original is so important? I mean, what, which one of these would have been closer to the original that people would have seen in the theater at the time since it came to the show? So this is a contradiction we've been talking about for the last six years. Um, and in fact, uh, we want to claim that both things are important. So first, we want something that's as close to the original as possible. In this case, Blu-ray is much closer to the, to the theoretical number of pixels that would be on a 35 millimeter film, or a 70 millimeter film. Um, right? They don't have pixels, it's chemical. Um, but it's definitely much, much um, deeper, richer image than a DVD. And Blu-ray is certainly closer to that experience. Um, but also, times change, we're never going to have that exact experience on video that you would have on film. Uh, and so sometimes it's worth, it's important that you have access to different kinds of media to talk about those kinds of media. Um, and actually a third way to look at it is to think about this effective response. Um, when people saw uh, Citizen Kane originally, um, there was a powerful, sharp image. Um, when they look at a DVD today, it looks as that student described it as looking um, at, at Avatar, it looks like you're looking at it through muddy glasses. 
Um, and so the experience of watching the Blu-ray is a little bit closer to the experience of watching the original 1940s, 35mm film. So there are three ways that, um, that are, it's important, but I think we need access to all of them. Um, to Ms. Wright, uh, you mentioned several trade groups, um, or groups that, uh, that uh, were advocating the benefit of, of using um, video in the classroom, correct? Um, what, I, what they're advocating for is for digital and informational literacy as part of the curriculum for first year writing for college students. Is there any, do they have any guidelines that um, refer to the quality of the, of the um, material that's being used? Well, the quality relates to the rhetorical impact of any text. So, I mean, you're, if, you, if I was going to do an analogy, i kind of differentiate between um, a person has a one-page alphabetic text with two paragraphs in it versus a person has that same exact text. And instead of having two paragraphs, the text is broken down into five paragraphs. I mean, a one-sentence paragraph can bring emphasis to the point. I'm talking about a text that's all letters. Mm -hmm. So it's the same content, but how you present it is meant for a different rhetorical purpose. So no, there isn't anything specifically mentioning the quality of videos, but the quality of a video has to be geared to the um, purpose and goal of your writing as customized to a particular audience. So if the clarity of diamonds is important to audience A, but not important to audience B, depending on what you're emphasizing, I mean, you need to, a person that's creating a text needs to have the ability to manipulate that text to the highest degree possible to achieve the impact that they want on that particular audience. And I think that's a when necessary, and that's what we're trying to get to, is when is, when is that high quality absolutely necessary? And um, I, mean, I think that's what we're trying to figure out. I hear a lot of, oh, there's some specific examples and some hypothetical ones. Well, I mean, when, a, when an individual is creating a text, like I've seen rubrics where teachers evaluate the text that the student created, and it may be a video text. If it's pixelated, the student, I, I know of situations where the student is marked down. Mm -hmm. Because I, I've been in a graduate class, a digital rhetoric class, where we were marked down if our images were pixelated. So we are graded on, it's the quality of the entire text. The, the clarity of your images is part of what you're presenting as a component of quality. So it would be like having sentences that didn't have clear meaning. That's the analogy that I can offer. Um, Ms. Hobbs, uh, I think it was Bruce who raised this question about um, what was the act of circumvention that was needed to access video games. It's an example that you pointed to. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware that video games require a circumvention yet, but I do think it's important and one of the reasons why I used those specific examples in my testimony today was to point to the fact that, um, that teachers are using a broad array of cultural products that are now normative in youth culture. So our job as educators is to make a connection between the content and the skills that we're trying to teach and the world that students grow up into. And so we try to help build that connection by using a wide array of cultural products. Um, it may be in the future that video games will uh, make use of CSS-like uh, encryption uh, tools, but that wasn't my point. My point was simply to say that educators need to be able to access a broad array of cultural products in order to make the connection between the classroom and the culture. I did notice in your um, in the written proposal, you made note of one example that I could identify where um, high quality specifically mattered. I believe that was Libby Drake um, teaching a high school course on film techniques. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, that that's one example where the, where the high quality was, was uh, made note of or it specifically seemed to be relevant. And the other portion, that was high school. We've heard a lot about high school, yet you're asking for K through 12. Right, would you like me to describe a really interesting example of a lesson that I did for seventh graders in a middle school? Um, 
So we were uh, trying to uh, talk a little bit about the difference between film and TV. Because when you're growing up, right, it's all on one box, right? Right? They're all shows, right? And so, well, actually, no, television is one kind of industry and film is another kind of industry. You may experience that seamlessly when you're 11, but it's important to understand the difference. And so one way you talk about the difference is to talk about the business part of how media is made. But another way you can introduce it to young people is to talk about the production values and the production techniques. So I used an excerpt from Princess Diaries and the Hannah Montana movie, right? Because in fact, you can see in the production techniques themselves the um, distinction between film style and uh, television style. In that activity with those 11 and 12 year olds, quality kind of mattered. Having access to uh, visual material that allowed us to see the difference between film production and television production. Mr. Bolas, you mentioned that while your example was pointing towards the use of Jing, you um, use Camtasia, and you, you own Camtasia. I am uh, given a copy of Camtasia by request from my tech department. Did you find any insane, similar problems with uh, quality? I know you mentioned the um, notion of uploading right. and the time constraints that uh, they're under and how that was a problem. Were there problems with Jing that you wouldn't have experienced with Camtasia? Were there, wait, so you, well, you, you noted that the I used, used Jing instead right. of Camtasia. Right, but are you familiar with Camtasia as well? I mean, Correct, yes. Uh, maybe I'm somewhat familiar, I don't use it um, quite often, but uh, I don't think there's a time limit using Camtasia. Um, and I believe you can save it as a file. Okay. With regard to the time, I understand queuing up multiple clips is something that has been pointed to multiple times. When you get to a clip that there has to be some threshold where you want to show five minute, 10 minute, when it's a longer clip, does that diminish the concern about needing to queue up? Would it be that? Um, burdensome to have to queue up when you're going to show one clip and then discuss it at length. Um, you're asking is it burdensome to queue up more Take for instance, the, no, no, I'm talking about one clip. You're talking clip. about the Citizen Kane. And the demonstration that you had was, you mentioned it was a little over five minute clip of Citizen Kane. Right. And it seemed like a lengthy discussion that you had. It just seems that maybe it's not terribly burdensome to have to queue up one specific clip that then is the topic of a, long, of a lengthy discussion. What do you queuing up one clip? I think um, is less burdensome. Absolutely, I would I would agree with that. But typically, you're doing more than one clip. Um, in that particular class, that's an 80 minute classroom. Uh, we did probably about 10 clips of Susan Kane. Um, you just didn't see it because I didn't uh, show it. But we certainly did more. Than, we did multiple clips. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, we've done clips from different versions of different films. So like. Uh, uh, you know, the, the two different versions, let's say, of the most popular uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Zeffirelli versus the, uh, uh, who's the, uh, uh, Baz Luhrmann's version of Romeo and Juliet. What were the points of comparison? I'm getting, I'm getting to the when the quality does matter, and um, it's going to be a recurring thing. Even time, every time there's an example of use of a clip, okay, how exactly did the, the enhanced quality beyond what's available through smartphone capture, screen capture, how is that relevant? Yeah. Why is it necessary for that? When you mentioned the Roman Juliet. Can you have, do you have an idea? Yeah, I was answering that in response to this idea of doing multiple clips. In the I know, and now that's an example where I mean, my, my follow-up is, how is the quality particularly relevant in that sort of comparison? Would another method be um, another alternative of showing those clips be sufficient? I don't think so. I think that, again, decoding something you want the best possible quality to be to be viewed as opposed to kind of trying to figure out things. You saw my students struggle with a screen capture uh, with not only uh, video, but also the audio quality. But we saw uh, studios struggle with a particular form of screen capture taken with the, the Jing. And um, to what extent, since we're really, uh, or the question is in terms of quality differentials, what is your, just to get back to the questions, Camtasia, that high end, uh, the same company makes three forms of uh, 
capture software. There's one Camtasia is the premium one, um, but then there's one in between that seems more comparable price-wise to the Appian that we have had some demonstrations on about 30 to 30 to 40 dollar range. What did you have you done any experimentation with those medium uh, priced? screen capture and noted any, you know, is it better? I would assume that since Jing is free, you get what you pay for. Right. Um, so what is the, do you have an experience in terms of the quality differential for the intermediate capture software? I have uh, limited experience with it, but yeah, the quality definitely is better um, with Camtasia, but it's, it's more expensive. It's not a free product. But then what about, and my question is, so that's the premium, what about the intermediate? versions that we, we saw demonstrations from um, the, from uh, others that, that, that uh, with the Appian software that uh, had uh, a different, perhaps a different quality, seemed to be uh, fairly good quality and the intermediate uh, TechSmith version also seemed, uh, I wonder if that's equivalent. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't have enough experience. I've used Camtasia mostly for screen casting and not for capturing video, where I'm just capturing what I'm doing on a computer screen. <coughs> the, it, it seems, okay, it, does anyone else have experience with that intermediate software? Appian, the, the uh, intermediate text version? No. I want to follow up with uh, Mr. Bullis. In the video that you showed, um, the students were saying it's hard to understand, and one of them said people talking over each other. Isn't that the nature of the of the content that was being watched? It's not people talking over each other in that scene. So sure. I, it was, I took away from that that that's why they had difficulty understanding. Am I incorrect? What am I, what am I missing? The, the difference was in how the audio was captured. So when I captured it the first way, using the screen capture software, I literally had to go into a room and lock it so that nobody would come into it because it was capturing it through the microphone of the computer. That's a poor audio quality and you would get from a straight rip from a DVD. And so you saw the two groups of students, but for time's sake, I edited it very heavily. Um, so the group I, I focused on specifically was the screen captured version and the audio is harder to understand um, hearing it from the screen captured version than it is from the DVD version. The kids in the other class did not have the same difficulties in decoding the audio. When you showed the DVD version, was, I'm sorry, the highest quality version, I don't remember if it was DVD. It was a DVD. Was that shown queued up, or was that acquired other ones? Um, that was queued up. Can I just get a clarification there? Sure. Because what your explanation of how you got the audio didn't jive with how I thought this worked, but I'm certainly no expert. Are you saying that with with a particular screen capture software you were using, the only way you can get the audio is through the computer's microphone? Yep. Correct. Is that standard with screen capture software? Yes, Bruce. Um, the Appian uh, product that we showed, um, the default is through the speakers, and actually what, what Tim Short had demonstrated was through the speak was captured, he captured it through the speakers. There are, however, settings that you can, um, you can go and, and, you, and capture in various forms of audio um, for the replay uh, software. So, so the default is through the speakers, but that's not the only way um, for the for the replay. That's correct. I would agree with what that. What it means if you sneeze during the middle of the screen yeah. recording, your sneeze uh, shows up in the recording. Oh, but only only if you have it set for the default. If you if you set it um, as you can to capture the audio internally, if you will, uh, from the audio stream on the computer, you wouldn't have that problem. And why would the default be to capture it to the speaker, which would strike me would be I don't know. It would be almost always low, lower quality. Because you, you, screen you, you, capture is designed to uh, do demonstrations. Right. The normative practice is I want to teach you how to use the mm -hmm. software, so I'll talk about yeah. the software while I'm so moving around. Allows, that, allows from from an industry point of view, right. it is okay. the appropriate uh, right. condition to set it can, can I add something very quickly? When you capture system audio, you're also capturing beeps yes. and blips from other programs on your computer. Mm -hmm. It's not just from that particular um, video. Steve, um, do you 
have to add about the twelve one status of screen capture software? We've heard from two others about that. And, and we didn't do the analysis that they did, the, the, the technical analysis that they did, but I have no reason to question the technical analysis that they did. And as we, we said uh, uh, three years ago that, that um, if, if it operates to capture the images from an unencrypted and otherwise unprotected signal without preventing any technological measure, then it's not a violation. Um, and as described by the technical study that, that uh, Bruce and, and Dean's folks did, that, that seems to describe uh, the particular program that they were using. Um, if it's unencrypted, and if it's not protected by some other type of access control, and I imagine that, that in the stream from the, the point at which it was being copy in that um, uh, with that software it was it was it was a unencrypted I think that was what Roger your study found and it, and it wasn't subject to any other access control I mean in theory you could have an unencrypted stream that is subject to password protection or something like that but this this is this wasn't so uh, we would basically concur based on the, the technological findings that they had. No it was mentioned um, the inability to capture, uh, let's say, Netflix video, and um, that was using, I believe, Jing as well, or was that confusing? Yeah, my teacher said it was uh, Camtasia. Or, actually, he was a little unclear. He said Camtasia or something like that. Okay. I've seen some indication that that is that that's a function of using Mac, and I know that the, the um, testimony was that they were using Mac. If there are alternatives, other operating systems, um, what would your reaction be? That why wouldn't an alternative use of an alternative operating system be the appropriate way to go? Well, as to an exemption? Uh, I think maybe the I, I'd like to call your attention to the spirit of the video clip that I shared with you. Here was a teacher uh, during his lunch hour, in the 30 minutes that he gets in his day. Uh, and he was actually chatting with me about the problems he encounters. So when he shared his story, I think what you got a feeling of from is that he made a pretty good effort to try to do screen capture, and it failed. He wasn't sure exactly why it failed, and he lacked perhaps the considerable expertise that someone might have to be able to identify what the problem was and then to try it again. I think that represents a significant obstacles uh, for ordinary for, for some ordinary people who are pretty busy. Why so, doesn't that just represent the fact that on one specific occasion, one specific person had difficulties which we really don't understand what those difficulties were or why they had occurred, uh, but isn't it dangerous to generalize from that one bit of anecdotal evidence based upon a 30-minute conversation you had David, that there's a general problem? David, I do 15 events in American middle school and high schools every year. At every event, teachers come up to me and tell me the challenges they have. I meant this example not to be an isolated incident, but one example in the 10 minutes that I was provided to give you an ex a specific example. Okay, but you have to understand, we have to make our decision based upon what's in our record. And if all that's in our record on that particular topic is a, a lunchtime interview with one teacher who had difficulty, while we may sympathize with him with respect to the difficulty he had on that one occasion, it's not clear to me that we can craft an exemption based upon his experience. And I realize that that's not all you're basing it on, but if to the extent that the Netflix issue is an issue, I'm not sure we've got enough of a record to go on. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. But I'm just saying, if all you've got is one conversation with someone who's not entirely sure what was going on, that's a pretty slim foundation upon which to build an exception. So we'll see you in three years. <laughs> well, <laughs> as you put it, I think it's a more practical response to that. Very quickly. Yes. Um, well, I'm sorry, I, I just want to put down a marker because I was trying to listen quite carefully <clears> to what that high school teacher said. And he said, I needed to go do the screen capture on Netflix because we couldn't find our DVD of this particular film that we had. And so CSS, as the access control, was completely irrelevant here. I mean, it wasn't the access control technical protection measure of CSS that was preventing this particular teacher from, from getting a clip. 
and the fact that the screen capture software, for whatever reason, didn't work when they were trying to record the unencrypted content coming from whether it was Netflix or any other streaming service, that's a problem of recording, but that has nothing to do with an access control measure. Well, can I just follow up on, on this discussion? Because it seems like uh, Netflix is, is a somewhat different issue because Netflix, to my understanding, involves, it re requires you to download Microsoft Silver Light in order to be able to access any of the streaming content, which is a secure path um, <coughs> type of software. So following up on, on Dean's point is that how does this relate to what would you circumvent even if, if there was an exemption? I mean, how would you, this, this isn't a CSS, uh, content scrambling system issue or an AACS issue, this is a completely different, which sort of gets into the 7G issues. If this gets broadened up to, broadened to the extent of including all online content, aren't we talking about many, many uh, types of technological protection measures, none of which are specifically identified in this rulemaking or uh, or what the consequences might be of having such uh, broad ability to <laughs> circumvent these many unnamed uh, protection measures. Um, so I just actually happened to be looking this up on the train down this morning and there are and there are at least three kinds of DRM I found uh, of copyright protection uh, TPMs that do advertise the ability to block screen capture. One was called High High Soft. DRMX, one was called Widevine, and one's called Artist Scope. I don't know where they're used, but they do advertise that ability. Um, we did, so now we, the exemption, the 2010 exemption, uh, is limited to, to DVDs and one kind of um, uh, copy protection. We did have an exemption for three years before that, uh, which applied generally to audiovisual media and didn't specify um, a specific technology that, that, could be, um, that could be circumvented. I don't, I, don't, I don't see why we should prioritize one technology over another. Well, maybe we should go back to the point that was raised earlier about with respect to Blu-ray, because I, having been on the 2006 rulemaking, all we were talking about at the time were DVDs, so I don't think that in the spirit of, of crafting that exemption, there was any intent to, um, and, and we had much less uh, online digital content that was available mm -hmm. as well. So, uh, and did, at what point in time did you interpret that exemption to include everything beyond uh, content scrambling system? Uh, so I agree the discussion was primarily about DVDs, um, but when I read the exemption and it was for all audiovisual works, I assumed that it was for all audiovisual works. Maybe we're just not very good drafters. <laughs> <laughs> we can fix that. <laughs> Spirit, did you have anything to add before? Um, yeah, very brief. we were talking about different platforms and the limitations of why not use a different platform. You know, coming from a school district that is uh, what we call platform agnostic, <laughs> meaning they do Mac and Windows, um, all of our feeder schools are Mac only. And, you know, so that sometimes that's what happens at public schools. They adopt one platform over another. So there isn't always another um, and platform I available. To that point, I was, it is a balancing is said, and if the, I don't know how burdensome it is if it was acquiring another operating system. Actually, it was the alternative to the need for exemption. It, it is burdensome at, at a school that only supports one platform. They will not support a different platform because that means that they have to service that. Right. But if you're using a different operating system, there, I mean, there do seem to be uh, various forms of screen capture software that operate. So that one particular form of screen capture software may have been limited to uh, a uh, PC operating system, Windows operating system, but there are other forms of screen capture software that are available for uh, multiple operating systems. In fact, while we're on the subject, I can't remember whether it was Dean or Steve, but one of you mentioned in your testimony when you were talking about Appian, okay, you also yeah. mentioned that you thought you've identified some other Mac based, and when you say you've identified it, wasn't clear to me whether you've identified it to us or you just identified <laughs> it internally. Yeah, the, the one that we had tested was Camtasia, so I want to be precise in what I'm saying about it. We, I don't believe, have tested it in terms of seeing how.
how well it functions to capture content off of various optical disc media or streaming media that, that may be encrypted. The, the research lab we used to test it was testing to see if it functioned in the same way that the replay software functioned, which is to capture content after it's been decrypted. And what we determined was that it captured the content after decryption, which led us to conclude that it does not violate the DMCA, and it is a tool that is available for the Mac platform. So to Steve's point, you would not be saying to all these students who are on a Mac system, sorry, you're out of luck. You have to now you know, buy a PC with, with Windows on it. What we can do, I think, is, is use get the software and use it and test it for various disk capture and Netflix captures to see whether it, it actually works as advertised. Our suspicion is that it does. But but just, at this point, you can't make any representations as to the quality of what you come up with using the Camtasia that's, format. That, that's correct. OK. Uh, I, I, I can, Bruce, can I mean, well, the, 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 I, sorry, you, you went up. You went a slightly different place with you, you talk about quality. I think Dean was talking about whether it's whether it's usable on Netflix. Yeah, so that's my, my point is yeah. that he can he can speak to that, but nobody on your side of the table can speak to whether let's assume for the moment that the Appian application that you yeah. demonstrated on May eleventh is yeah. absolutely fine for all purposes. Yeah. I think the people over there might disagree yeah. or they might not. I haven't yeah. heard anything out of them so far. But let's assume that it's perfect. It does everything you need to do. You're not in a position to represent that Camtasia for Mac or any other Mac based application is as good in terms of what it will give you. Well, our, our technical firm that did the testing said that it is as good. OK, did this, well, is that in our record? Uh, it is now. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> your say, a hearsay statement is in our record, but that's um, about all no, it is. I, I mean, if, 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 you want, if you want further, we're, we're happy to, you know, if you want to you provide a question, we're happy to answer. Well, we'll mull that one over. Um, OK, thanks. Um, by way of comparison, I do want to get reaction from this side of the room um, about the testimony in our tech day showing the high school social studies teacher and his use of screen capture, as well as the, uh, the review that was part of the testimony today. Um, I, I don't recall which brand, but, um, but an uploaded user review. Any reaction to the fact that some of these uses using screen capture and the quality seems to be um, completely acceptable? Well, well I, I guess, again, th there's, there's a couple of ways of responding. One is that if the quality is the same, then why are we here? Meaning, meaning, meaning you know, if, if the quality, if, if what you're able to see is the same using the lawful decryption of, of whether it's CSS or Blu-ray or whatever is the same as what you're able to get using the screen capture, then why are they bothering with using this technological protection if it's so easy to circumvent and you're able to see the same thing? So obviously, you aren't able to see the same thing. Obviously, there is a qualitative difference, a significant enough qualitative difference that, you know, that, that, that they're, a, you know, that, that, that uh, Dean and, and, and Bruce's clients are willing to, to spend all this money uh, 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 supporting this, uh, this effort of, 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 of distributing stuff, material in this protected form. So there's obviously got to be a qualitative difference. And the second thing is, is just I can tell you as, uh, as a parent of kids that they can see, you know, they're very sensitive to all of these subtle qualitative differences, even, even not so subtle. So for example, you know, I grew up with a black and white television, so even when I see a black and white movie, I'm comfortable. That's part of my, my environment. I'm able to respond to a black and white film. My kids, having grown up in a world of color films uh, and color television and, and, and large screen television, they have a great difficulty watching a black and white film. I mean, so no version of Citizen Kane is going to satisfy them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's true. I mean, it's something. It, it, it is, a, and I'm sure they'll say. You know, the, the educators can say it's a real challenge to get a kid to watch a black and white film well, because so it is how do you, so. How do you square this with my experience, which is that uh, I've got daughters who were 
One's in her late teens now, the other's in her early 20s. But they and their friends, half of what they watch, they watch on their smartphones. And you can't tell me the quality of what they're watching on that little screen is all that high, and they seem perfectly happy to do that. How do you score that with what you're saying about high quality? Uh, Renee and then Peter. Okay, so it's really actually bizarre to be in a room full of lawyers talking about quality, because while quality is a fixed, can be defined as a fixed dimension of a, of a product, I think what Martine was trying to say earlier is that quality is a subjective experience. We've just shared with you that from our experience as, as, as educators working with young people, that <coughs> their expectations about image quality are subjective as they are, as unique and, as they are, but they're expectations that are based on the context the situation and the purpose. When I'm watching a movie while I'm walking through the mall on my smartphone, I have one expectation. When I'm sitting in a high school film class or a social studies class, I have a different expectation. So quality, well, you might want to narrow it to think of it as a fixed dimension or property of the artifact, is so much more. It's Quality is based on the expectation of the user, and that's dependent on context, situation and purpose. That's why we're coming to you. That's why we've been coming to you. That's why quality matters. Peter. Um, so I'll give you two examples. Um, they've given you before, but I'll come to you. Um, one is from my 2005 um, comments, so please don't remember. Uh, but uh, you know, I, when I taught this um, Charlie Chaplin clip many times, um, uh, I don't actually a beat up 60 millimeter print um, from a 1950 film called The Immigrant. It was always a kind of uh, academic discussion about immigration, uh, whatever else it was about. Uh, when the DVD came out, uh, when I showed the DVD, uh, the same clip, and the students laughed for the first time. All of a sudden, it became it was alive for them. You know, we had never had it before in a beautiful you know, copy. Um, I'm pretty sure if I uh, brought up the same DVD today um, versus the Blu-ray, it's the Blu-ray that would make them laugh and they would respond to it and not the DVD. It's a good experiment. We should try it. Um, another example that's in the test, that's in the, uh, in the comment from this time, it's real thinking, um, uh, has, has, speaks to um, the question of, uh, of Camtasia and other, um, other capture software. We really have tried a lot of them. Um, they all have um, insufficient frame rates um, so that, so that um, there is a jerkiness to it. Um, individual frames can be lost. Um, you know, the, the quality of the image is degraded in many, many other ways. There's a bleed through. Um, Sometimes the, uh, they actually have an absolute uh, number of pixels in capture that doesn't match Blu-ray or other high definition formats. Um, but one example is, uh, is from John McKay, who's a solid professor at Yale University, uh, who's done a lot of work on the, um, the uh, early uh, Soviet filmmaker, Zika Bertov. Um, and he studied his, uh, his charts for making his 1929 film movie camera. And it turned out that, um, that he tried to pace the editing in such a way that you'd be able to perceive faster and faster cuts. And at one point, there's actually one single frame, uh, in which there's an image that only exists for one frame. Um, and when I saw him give this lecture, um, you know, actually showed the clip, I didn't see the frame. Uh, when he showed me the clip again after I seen the charts, I actually saw the one frame. Um, if there was a Camtasia version, you know, there's a 50% chance that that frame would have been in, the, in, the, in there, and 50% chance that it wouldn't have been. Um, right? that, that lecture couldn't have been given, he couldn't teach that. For example, to the students. Well, maybe he could, but you know, it's hit or miss. Have you looked into the Appleon software that was mentioned in their initial comment and it's demonstrated in May 11th? I haven't exactly looked at that. Okay. And I'd like to get a response from your side to the point made by Jonathan. If the quality is the same, how come you're still concerned about protecting it? <coughs> uh, if I, could, I don't think the testimony was that the quality was the same. I think the testimony from the Coolsville High School teacher was that the quality was acceptable and good for his classroom. Uh, you know, I. I I said jokingly, we have the battle of the high school social studies teachers, but we do. I mean, obviously the students at, at New Career in that example uh, felt you know, they had much more, they had seen that more difficulty getting the, uh, the, the, the point that was trying to be taught in, in, in the screen capture setting. Uh, you saw the screen capture material that, that uh, was demonstrated on May 11th and that statement there, as I recall it, was that, that it was well received in the class and he felt comfortable as a teacher that he could achieve his pedagogical goals with this screen capture material. Um, I'm sure there's not going to be any one uh, de definitive answer that satisfies everybody. 
burden is on the proponents to show that that, that uh, they're substantially impeded in the ability to make a non-infringing use because of this. But I think the other point that comes from this discussion is, is really it was in the Library Copyright Alliance testimony and it was in, in Renee's statement just now is the, the, the necessity criteria that you have in the existing exemption is completely subjective. There will never be a case, it seems, in which uh, uh, somebody who's entitled to use the exemption will, will say, well, it's okay to use screen capture. It's okay, you know. The, and I don't blame the, from, from the perspective of the teacher, of course you want the highest quality that you can get. But as Dean said, this is a balancing process. The cost of, of, of permitting every, every single form of access control distribution of motion pictures to be circumvented, which is what the proponents are asking for. It, and to allow, especially to allow that in K through 12, students and, and teachers, as well as throughout the, the post-secondary area, is that we'll really be, you know, we will have perhaps 200 million people in the United States that are entitled to, to circumvent this protection. I think at that point, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, and well before that point, you know, it is, what is the trade-off there in terms of, as you heard in the Los Angeles hearing, the importance, the, the necessity for robust access controls to promote the type of dissemination of material that I think the industry is now doing. Can you have something? I, I, I did want to add something because even if you assumed, and I'm assuming arguendo here, that the screen capture uh, technology, the video capture technology software, produced the content that was in the same quality as, although I'm ACS, I'm going to speak for, for DVD here now, if Bruce, if Bruce permits me. I'm also a board member of DVD CCA, so I feel like I have a little bit of leeway here. But, but assume the quality is the same. Jonathan is sort of saying, why, why do we bother? And we bother for a very real reason. If you look at what happened to the music industry with the CDs being a completely in the clear format, with no access control whatsoever, and people would put them in their computers and drag and drop the little image and a full copy would be made and it was seamless to do and took about two seconds and then could be uploaded to the internet. It led to a lot of unauthorized use and a perception that this was okay to do. That is precisely why we apply access controls to our works so that it is not so easy and seamless to make digital copies. When you use a video capture software, you are taking a very deliberative act to apply the software, play the clips you need. It's not the same as just doing a drag and drop with a mouse. And so we are businesses. If we thought access control measures, which we spend a lot of time and resources and money to develop, provided absolutely no protection for our works, we wouldn't apply them. And so I just don't think there's a basis for saying, oh, well, access controls are useless because you can use video capture software the same quality. The, the, the other point I wanted to make is I want to make sure that our side of the aisle is not sort of perceived as saying we do not believe cultural products should be used in the classroom because that's not what we're saying. What, what, what I've heard some folks say is you need to have the original. You need to be as close to the original as possible. If you've got the original manuscript, you use the original manuscript even if it's a medieval manuscript. Well, if there's one manuscript, it's only available in one location. It's not available in all sorts of locations around the country, and so you show a copy of the manuscript. Same thing with art. Sure, it's great to see the Mona Lisa at the Louvre Museum, but not every student gets to do that, and so you use copies that are sometimes of less quality than the original, but still perfectly satisfactory for pedagogical purposes. And so I, I feel this notion of if the highest quality is there, we automatically need access to it, otherwise we can't achieve our educational purposes. I, I just think that argument sort of starts to fall apart. Okay, just a caveat. We're close to running out of time, and we do have more questions. So before you open your mouth, <clears throat> think how important it is to say what you're going to say and be as succinct as you can. Because the questions that didn't get asked might be really important, and you might wish we'd ask them. Go ahead. Uh, two really short points, three points. Um, I understand that side's not opposed to education, but on this side, we think that if you bring every student to the Mona Lisa, to study the Mona Lisa, that would be a good thing. It would be better than having them study all the copies. We can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, 
And the second point is, um, I think a lot of this discussion of the effect of uh, an exemption that we have on, on Blu-ray and high definition is obviously conjectural, but we do have seven years of evidence of an exemption that covers DVDs, and um, even when they were you know, younger in their, in their life. And, uh, and we haven't seen um, any massive abuse of the exemption or any degradation of the DVD market as a result of the exemption. Okay, let's stop, let's stop right there and, and ask that side. Is that last statement accurate as far as you know? Well, on, on, the, on the DVD side, I think we'll show in, in relation to one of the panels this afternoon a chart that'll show um, how DVD um, sales have basically Gone, had gone up till 2004, 2005, and have gone down um, since then. They're you trace that to the issues of the exemption. <laughs> 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 right, yeah. <laughs> why, that's, why that's the case. I'm not saying it's, it's the exemption. On the other hand, I don't know that either one of us can say with certainty that it did or it didn't have an effect uh, on, on the uh, sales of, of, of the. Yeah, I, this, if, I could, if I could just add, I, I, I think. We have, uh, as we indicated, in, 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 assuming that they, you, you're persuaded that they've met their burden, we would not object to a renewal of the existing exemption. But remember, that is just, that is a for a, a more lim much more limited category, both of users and of and products, than what's being asked for here. Just one response to Steve's 200 million rejection. I don't know where that number came from. There are three million teachers in American public schools, and almost 40% of them have a master's degree, right? The average American teacher is 54 years old. She's gonna be teaching for another 15 years. We want teachers to be able to use uh, the newest technology because technology supports innovation in education. I don't see any reasonable reason to make a distinction between a 54-year-old middle school or elementary school or high school teacher and a college professor working at the community college level. I just ask a question that falls up about you. Martine, at one point you had talked about the, with the cell phone issue that there could be some confusion. That um, yeah, I'm really actually worry about that. Well, let me, it. to what extent, I'm wondering to what extent there's confusion about the existing exemption. And uh, that where circumvention is, is allowed, where there are, someone believes and has reasonable grounds for believing that the, the quality of, on that DVD was necessary. So the question is, to what extent is there an evaluation being made between various options for the particular work that's going to be shown in a classroom? For instance, you mentioned at, at one point that, that uh, there were some, uh, sometimes you want to teach about uh, economic theories or about, um, well, let's just take that example. To what extent do you need specific quality to talk about economic theory, okay. theories? Well, that, that was an example from an economics professor, but to get to answering your question, what I was going to comment on about the example for, about Mona Lisa going and actually seeing it or take, you know, what, how important is quality. That whole argument is premised on the idea, and this whole focus on quality is premised on the idea that your whole purpose is to just reproduce what someone else has created instead of what we're looking at is the students and the teachers, uh, the students actually are making something new that is their own work. And so, why wouldn't they want all the components of their own new work, which would be the fair use piece, to be of the highest quality possible? Why, why, is, it, why is it acceptable to tell a student that they can have a pixelated image of Mona Lisa, if they're making some kind of cultural commentary on it because what they're saying isn't really that important anyway? I mean, what is the logic behind not allowing students or creators of text that are relying on the exemption to not be able to create the highest quality possible. I, I don't understand So that. does that mean that the exemption is being seen as basically, as I think the point was made uh, by Steve, that in all cases um, that circumvention is, is necessary? Circumvention is necessary. It, it, it's seen as that when, I do the, when I've done the workshops at my college, um, this, they ask about students, well, what, can, what are the students allowed to do? Now, in the current language you have, it's, there's a big ambiguity because 
is this, if the student's making a non-commercial video, then are they covered under that lake? Or if the student is making a documentary film, are they covered under that lake? Or are they not allowed to do those two things just because they're a student? So, you know, it's, it's almost like you already are including students in the exemption now indirectly, and they haven't demonstrated any harm. I mean, we, we went through this whole screen capturing conversation in 2010, and it got really big, and it lasted into the summer and so forth. But what I see the other side doing is just trying to make barriers so, so that we don't do it at all. Is, is what the wish is. And I just want to say, um, just to comment on the smartphones and taking the smartphone, just imagine a room of 40 students and, I, and we're watching a, a current movie and I say, okay, everybody take out your smartphone now in the classroom and take the clip you want for this montage you're gonna make. I mean, you don't just really, I don't think that they really understand the implications of what it would mean to say it's okay to take movies with your, start, with your smartphone when you've got all your context in there. It just, yeah, it just scared me. Peter, I wanted to ask you, um, you pointed to the example of the immigrant and um, use of the 16 millimeter and then DVD. Um, yeah, yeah, if, you had, if you had um, shown the class a screen capture version of it, what do you, do you know, did you ever try that first of all, and um, do you think they would have gotten the point? That it would have been a discussion of immigration or would have been laughter? Have you tried? Um, no, no. I, you know, I actually, I've, I've looked at screen capture versions. I've never seen one that I thought was ready to be brought into my class. Mm -hmm. okay. maybe, um, maybe I should do it as an experiment for this for this mm -hmm. rulemaking, but otherwise, it wouldn't serve them well. And I, and I, you know, I've looked at it. We we have screen capture available in uh, the Wide Information Commons. Uh, we tell people about it. It's not used that often because it's just not up to the par. Uh, it's not up to the standards we we hold the classroom. Yeah. And our classroom time is valuable. Has anyone else tried and failed? Got, not gotten the reaction that um, that they were aiming for. Not okay. Give me an example. No, like I tried to use Camtasia to, to take clips, and it doesn't. Okay, but you haven't shown them to the class when it does work, and had failed to um, elicit the point to. to um, no. no, but I mean, I can't. It doesn't tape it at all. It just makes it all black, no matter what I have done. Okay, well, it's sometimes it has worked, and that's a, okay. it has worked, and then but it's failed in the classroom setting. You actually acquire the video, maybe at a diminished quality than you ultimately desire. Okay. But, but, but I think it's important to remember that, you know, what they're trying to do is teach, right? That's their objective. Mm -hmm. and, and spending a lot of time figuring out every possible software, I mean, it's, you know, th th we have an education crisis in this country. And so the idea to make it more difficult, especially at K-12, now, when there's a simple solution out there that's not going to cause any harm, to instead say, okay, let's come up with, make, make, put a burden on all these teachers who are not technologists to figure out all of these ways that they can do to get to the same point, uh, it, it just, it, it seems to me to be uh, really short-sighted. Can I just ask, what kind of DVD ripping software do, you, do any of you use? And it's, it's not a statement against interest at this point. And what uh, and what's the cost of that? Uh, DVD shrink on Windows, it's free, and Handbrake on the Mac, which is also free. Yep, I use Handbrake. It's free. It's great. You can. Uh, uh, it's very fast. Uh, the quality is very good, and it actually gets better all the time. And you can um, uh, you can choose short portions. Um, the um, Blu-rays are more complicated. One I have not used, but I've read about. It's called ACSoft. I don't remember how to spell it. Um, but that also is, works like Handbrake, and you can rip short portions, not and also rip the entire work and create a, a, a copy, a small copy. Here, I have one more question. That's sure. uh, about various versions of screen capture. Uh, I noted that it's been part of the discussion in these uh, proceedings before. And have you reevaluated? It seems like there's improvements in that technology. Have you Reevaluated in what uh, frequency? Yeah, so screen capture has definitely improved in the last three years, but it hasn't kept pace with technology, and it has, it's not even up to the place we would hope to would have been three years ago. Um, I, uh, I was working with a team of uh, students at American University, and together we tried a number of different programs, um, including Camtasia, um, Snap Z Pro, or Snap Pro, whatever it's pronounced. Um, we've tried different settings. Uh, we were using top of the line equipment, um, and still it's just not. 
it's not uh, the same quality that you had um, right by using uh, a DVD program. I, I think ultimately for me is it's the time that you spend capturing. I think that gets lost a lot. The amount of time you spend capturing. It, you know, it, to, to, to rip a DVD or to rip a CD, as I think you overstated, ripping a CD does not take, it's not instantaneous. It takes time and it is a deliberate action. And so the time you spend to do that is substantial time as an educator and as a person that may have, you know, 25 students in a lab. It, it is a substantial amount of time to, to do the screen cap. Bruce, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to um, respond in terms of the, I mean, we demonstrated a screen capture software program that was used by a real teacher who um, demonstrated it real time here on May 11th on how it was used. I don't think it took an enormous amount of time. Um, it, and he had uh, done other, uh, at home, had, had done other copies for integration into his classroom presentation uh, and was perfectly satisfied you know, with that. I don't, I can't speak to why Camtasia didn't work in, in certain circumstances. The, the lab that we employed uh, uses it you know, regularly and finds it perfectly uh, acceptable and told us um, respond, you know, that it was equivalent um, in terms of quality and, and usability to the replay that was on the screen. All right. Well, we've actually killed up. Dean, you're, you're going to blow our presentation. <laughs> oh, I just have right. one tiny, tiny remark to make. It's, I just, and maybe this is obvious, but I, I, I feel that sometimes this gets lost, which is that Understanding in, in, in media classes and film classes where often professors are probably showing lots of clips from different movies and need to have those clips you know, immediately available and not queue up uh, the, the original is, is, is a concern. But for so many other educational uses where you're either going to show the entire film or just show one portion of a film to make one point, the, the original DVD or Blu-ray is always available for classroom use. It's not like that quality product is banned from the classroom. And so I just wanted to remind everyone of that. Okay. Great, well, that takes care of this particular panel. Um, we may or may not have follow-up questions for you. So the message is don't call us, we may call you. <laughs> uh, if not, the record is closed. Um, we are due to start back at one o'clock. Five after twelve, so let's say one o five. But we've got a busy afternoon, so we do need to start precisely at one o five. For those of you who want to eat, there is a cafeteria on the sixth floor, which is better than it was three years ago.